I like my office. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us here in Washington, D.C. for a conversation with Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke as he takes questions from teachers about the Federal Reserve and the economy. My name is Rose Pianalto, and I work at the Board of Governors, and I look forward to moderating today's session. Here in the boardroom of the Federal Reserve, we are pleased to host a group of 80 educators who teach economics and personal finance to young people. We are also joined via video conference by educators from all over the country who are participating in local events in 34 regional reserve bank and branch offices, as well as many who are viewing this via web webcast. Through this session, the Federal Reserve System seeks to give you insight into our goals and activities so we can support the work that you do with students as you strive to teach them how the decisions made by the central bank affect them, their families, and the economy. Today, we are honored to bring to you Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke, who once, like you, was an educator. Before coming to the Board of Governors in 2002, Chairman Bernanke worked as a professor of economics and public, public affairs at Princeton University. He also chaired the Department of Economics from 1996 to 2002. Chairman Bernanke served as a governor of the Federal Reserve System from 2002 to 2005. And in 2005, he became the chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He returned to the Federal Reserve as the chairman of the Board of Governors in 2006. Chairman Bernanke grew up in Dillon, South Carolina, and received a BA in economics from Harvard University and a PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I might add that Chairman Bernanke's wife, Anna, is also a teacher. So thank you for joining us today, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Rose forgot to mention that I served two terms on the Montgomery, New Jersey School Board. <laughs> so so I, I, have some, uh, I have some direct exposure to, uh, to public education as well as to university education. Um, I do want to welcome you all to here today. Um, as educators, your work is critical to the nation and to our economy. Well-prepared students make for a productive and innovative workforce as well as for a functioning democracy. The economist Alfred Marshall once said that economics is the study of people in the ordinary business of life. And I can't imagine anything more fundamental than that. Learning about economics helps students understand how the decisions of millions of people about what to produce and what to consume determine what Adam Smith called the wealth of nations, our living standards. In particular, economics helps students understand both the strengths and the weaknesses of our free market-based system. Now, I'm sure your students have been eager to understand the economic and financial events of the last couple of years. The recent financial crisis was among the most profound challenges to economic and financial stability since the Great Depression. And its causes and its ultimate remedies have been and will continue to be widely debated. The study of economics will allow your students to join that debate in a responsible and informed way. One of the key lessons of the recent financial crisis is the importance of personal financial literacy. Many of you teach your students the skills necessary to make good financial decisions. Your efforts are of paramount importance in helping students understand how to save for the future and how to invest their money to make it grow. In retrospect, some of the people who were hurt the most during the financial crisis borrowed money they shouldn't have borrowed or signed financial contracts they shouldn't have signed. Today, students need a solid understanding of the benefits and the risks of borrowing money to buy a car or to buy a home and of the effect that too much credit card debt can have on their personal finances. Besides improving their personal financial decision making, teaching your students economic principles will help them as citizens understand and make choices about many of the critical issues that today confront our nation. The Federal Reserve works hard to advance financial literacy and economic education, both through our own programs and through our work with other organizations. Our financial education website provides easy access to free educational materials, a resource search engine for teachers, and games for students of various ages and knowledge levels. Some of the 12 reserve banks around the country offer economic and financial economic 
uh, education workshops for teachers. And several reserve banks periodically provide lessons in personal finance to middle and high school students. A number of the reserve banks also run academic competitions for the middle school, high school, and college students, such as the Fed Challenge, Econ Bowl, and other essay contests. I've had the opportunity on a few occasions to judge in this room the finals of the uh, Fed Challenge, which is an opportunity for kids to learn what the Fed does, learn about the economy. It's a great experience, and I've seen some really impressive performances from, uh, from high school kids. Also, some reserve banks have open learning centers or museums in their lobbies that feature interactive exhibits and related educational programs. So if you are in a reserve bank city or in a branch city, in which there are 24 branches as well as 12 reserve banks, please inquire to see what kinds of exhibits and materials they have. Teachers tell us that visiting these centers have provided their students with valuable learning experiences. Well, I just wanted to thank you for this, uh, accepting our invitation to join in this conversation. I appreciate that you're taking time away from your personal and professional uh, commitments to be with us. As a central banker, an economist, an educator, and as a parent, I do want to thank you all for your work. It's absolutely central to our economy. It's central to our democracy that we have well-educated, well-trained students. And I also applaud the ongoing partnerships between regional reserve banks and their educators and I'd like to express also my appreciation for Reserve Bank staff who were involved in coordinating this meeting today. So again, welcome to the Federal Reserve. Those of you on, uh, on simulcast, uh, welcome to this meeting. And I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Our first question is from a teacher um, in the Richmond District who is with us today in the boardroom. Would you please introduce yourself and ask your question? I'm Robert Handy from Butler High School in Hartford County, Maryland. What has been the greatest success as well as the greatest failure of the Federal Reserve in the last 100 years? And if you were teaching a high school U.S. history class today, what is the most important aspect of the Federal Reserve's role in history you would want students to understand? Well, I hope that your students, uh, if they come through civics or history, they, they learn about the Federal Reserve. It's a very, very important institution. It's had a huge impact uh, in the almost one, we're back to our 100 year anniversary, about to celebrate our centennial. The Federal Reserve was uh, founded in 1913. Um, and it's been uh, a tremendous, as I said, a tremendous part of, of US economic uh, history. I would say the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the greatest failure to start there uh, is no doubt the Great Depression of the 1930s, to which the Federal Reserve made, unfortunately, an important contribution. Um, the Fed uh, was very slow to expand the money supply uh, during the Great Depression. As a result, it countenanced a severe deflation or falling prices during the early 1930s. The Fed was also insufficiently proactive in trying to stabilize the financial system. As you probably know, about a third of all the banks in the United States failed during the 1930s, a tremendous uh, collapse of our banking system. And those two things together were very important in making the Depression as deep and as long as it was. By the way, um, as we dealt with the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009, we tried to take those lessons to heart we tried to make sure that monetary policy was aggressive to prevent deflation, and we tried to take whatever steps were necessary to keep our banking system from collapsing. Um, so at least we tried to learn from history. I think one of the most, or probably the most important success of the Federal Reserve uh, in the past century uh, was probably after the period of the 70s when we had a lot of inflation. Um, the Federal Reserve under Chairman Paul Volcker uh, brought down inflation conquered inflation, and we now have very, very low inflation, very stable prices. And in that process, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, achieved uh, quite a bit of prosperity and economic growth in the United States, and was a very, very uh, important uh, uh, contribution to, to that period. Um, going forward, um, I think students should understand uh, those two elements of what the Fed has done and hasn't done. And the first is uh, financial stability. Uh, it's very important for the Fed to contribute to keeping our financial system stable and productive. And secondly, price stability. Um, only the central bank can affect inflation, and keeping inflation low and stable is good for our economy, and it's a very important responsibility for, for the Fed. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you. Next, we'll go to our Miami office for a question. Thank you. My name is Nancy Weiner, and I teach math at Thomas Jefferson Middle School in North Miami Beach, Florida. <laughs> Chairman Bernanke, I would like to ask you, what are the greatest challenges that the Federal Reserve System faces over the medium and long term? Well, we certainly have in the near term and the medium term, we certainly have some very, very difficult challenges. Um, uh, first and perhaps foremost, um, even though our economy is stabilized and growing, uh, clearly it's still a very, very difficult time uh, for many Americans. The unemployment rate is still almost 10%. Um, inflation is quite low. Uh, and the Federal Reserve has a responsibility. Not the, we're certainly not the only policymakers that can affect uh, the state of the economy by any means, but we need to do our part to help the economy recover and help make sure that jobs come back uh, to the United States. We have a, another very important uh, responsibility in the short term, which is the implementation of the new financial regulatory reform legislation. The so-called Dodd-Frank Act was passed and signed by the President just in July, and it is essentially the most ambitious overhaul of our system of financial regulation since the 1930s. And a great deal of that has to be accomplished, uh, put in place by the financial regulators, including the Federal Reserve and also including other regulators like the F uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and others. But the Fed has a very important role uh, in, in putting, that, uh, putting that in place. So those are two very important challenges in the near term. The long term, it's hard to know. You know, it's hard to know where our economy will be and what the Fed's role will be. Um, based on uh, what I was just saying a few moments ago, I think we want to be sure to maintain price stability. Um, we want to learn as much as we can about our economy so that we can be even more effective in keeping stability in our economy. And I say one other thing, which is that it's, it's very, very important that the Federal Reserve uh, remain independent, that it remain able to make decisions for the economy based on our views of what the economy needs and not based on short-term political considerations. And so maintaining our independence, maintaining our nonpartisan uh, nature, uh, which is focused on what is the best for the economy and not what is politically expedient, I think that's a really critical thing for us to try to maintain uh, going forward. Uh, Dr. Bernanke, um, you had spoken at one point about uh, the crisis of uh, the media, not so much the media, but just the domino effect of how, um, sorry, I should, <laughs> I should have been prepared. <laughs> um, the crisis of confidence, I'm sorry, was your quote, and how the, the role of the media plays in that um, and how it becomes a domino effect. And as we look at our recession as we're pulling out, um, as the reports come out that we're out of the recession or in the recession, what kind of role does the media play in that, do you believe? So the question was about confidence and what role does the media play in confidence? Well, first of all, let me say that confidence is really important. Consumer confidence, we follow that very carefully. People are more confident, they're more willing to spend, they're more willing to, to uh, um, invest. Um, and so that, that's very important. And business confidence is also uh, very important. Uh, firms, in order to hire, in order to expand their operations, they need to be confident about the economy. Now, the media is no doubt very important, but I hope your students understand to be a little bit skeptical about the media because there's nothing more exciting than when things are going well and nothing more devastating when things are going badly, according to the media, right? So if people can develop, uh, if students can learn to develop an appropriate skepticism to think for themselves about where the economy is and what's happening, um, we'll avoid, I think, some of that, uh, that echo chamber that can make the good times seem too hot and the bad times seem too cold. So um, again, education is getting kids to think for themselves, getting them to listen to a wide variety of sources, not just the television, and, uh, uh, and having, I think, learning from that. If you look at American history, if you look at the last uh, 234 years or so of American history, the United States has always prospered, it's always grown, it's always succeeded, it's come through tremendous challenges, it'll come through these challenges. If people have that perspective, then their confidence will be stronger. 
How are we doing? Yes. Other questions? <laughs> Kiss me, I'm in the yellow. Um, thank you again for inviting us and teaching civics back for 15 years, and this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, what fiscal policy is Measure would you suggest uh, would help the economy? Check, check. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, what fiscal policy measure would help the economy and the Fed's monetary policy stance? So I first have to say that the Federal Reserve is nonpartisan. Right. So we have to be very careful not to take one side or the other in terms of one fiscal issue or another. Um, before I try to jump into that for one moment, let, let me just make sure that. Um, how, just to say how important it is that your kids understand the difference between fiscal and monetary policy. And I think that often is, that, that distinction is not often so clear. Fiscal policy, of course, has to do with the federal government's spending and tax plans. And of course, the Federal Reserve has nothing to do with that. You know, what we do is manage the money supply, which helps affect short-term interest rates and, and uh, therefore inflation uh, and also affects growth. But there are two very different sets of policies, and I think sometimes people don't really distinguish uh, those two. And again, the policy makers are very different because fiscal policy is made by the Congress and the administration. Um, we try to advise them when we can, but of course they're responsible, whereas the Federal Reserve independently makes monetary policy. On fiscal policy, we have a very difficult situation because in the short run we have a, um, an economy which, uh, even though we're in a recovery, is still far from full employment. And so in that sense, uh, there's a lot of desire, you know, incentive to, to provide additional support to the economy, and at least not to uh, cut spending or raise taxes in a way that would be bad for recovery. But on the other side, we have very serious long-term budget problems, as you know. You know, as our society is aging um, uh, and as medical costs keep going up, the government's obligations to pay Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, among other things, mean that we have very, very serious long-term uh, fiscal debt situation. So we're kind of caught between the desire in the short run to be more expansive and in the long run to be more frugal. And that, that's a hard combination. And I think, uh, if possible, I think combining those two in that way is the right way to go. In other words, whatever we can do to um, persuade the public that we, now I say we as a country, and talking about Congress, uh, that we are serious about tackling our longer-term budget issues, that we're going to take the steps necessary to reduce our long-term debt, that in turn would give us more space, more flexibility to move, you know, to, to be more expansionary in the short term. So that's, that's the challenge, is to find ways to credibly commit to reducing our long-term debt, uh, and in doing so would give us additional flexibility if we decided to use it to help support the recovery today. All right, we're going to try to go back to Boston to see if we can bring Boston in. Boston, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can hear you. Hey, OK. <laughs> Afternoon, Chairman Bernanke. <laughs> Thank you for uh, rejoining with the Academy again. <laughs> My name is Bob Awkward. I'm an associate professor of business and economics at Middlesex Community College, the crown jewel of the community college system here in Massachusetts. <laughs> My question for you today, it's a follow-on to that question you just answered. The combination of monetary and fiscal policies have helped to move the economy in the right direction, yet growth has remained stubbornly sluggish. What do you see as the major contributing reasons for this? Well, first, let me, uh, let me say one thing, which is um, I want to commend you for your work in a community college. Um, community colleges, junior colleges, technical schools, one of the great strengths uh, of our educational system is that we have so many diverse ways for people to, to, to educate themselves, to achieve skills. And uh, I think that's a real strength of our, of our, of our economy and our system. So uh, those of you who are in uh, alternative, uh, in either in uh, junior colleges or alternative, uh, uh, alternatives through uh, uh, the standard uh, four-year college, uh, I think those are very important. In terms of why the recovery is slow, uh, that's obviously something that we're we're uh, very interested in and spending a lot of time uh, investigating. It's not at all uncommon uh, for a recovery that follows a financial crisis to be relatively slow. Um, we've seen that historically. 
uh, in many other countries as well as in the United States. Um, the reasons for that are, are several. One is that the financial system is so important to our economy that if the banks, for example, have not yet recovered fully to health or the financial markets are not yet functioning at the normal level, that, that is itself a, um, a drag on growth. Likewise, if you look at uh, household finances, um, one of the things that happened during the, the boom that preceded our financial crisis was that people took on a lot of debt. Uh, house prices went up, mortgages went, uh, mortgage borrowing went way up, uh, loan to value ratios were, were very high, down, low down payments. Um, so a lot of people find themselves on the one hand uh, worried about job security, uh, and on the other hand, finding that they have a lot of debt, a lot of interest payments to make. And so they're cutting back. And what we're seeing is that um, uh, consumer saving rates uh, are going up, which is not a bad thing in itself, but from the point of view of the economy as a whole, means that consumer spending uh, is not there to drive economic growth the way uh, it normally would be. So uh, that, combined with the fact that our labor market has not yet really begun to take off, although it, it is expanding, again, means that there's still a, an air of caution in the economy, both uh, on the part of households and on the part of businesses, that, that is keeping growth from, from um, being as rapid as we would like. That being said, um, the uh, National Bureau of Economic Research, as you probably know, declared the recession over in June 2009. Now, what that means, just to make sure everybody understands, means that as of around June of last year, the economy stopped contracting and since then has been growing. Now, it doesn't mean we're back to normal. It doesn't mean that unemployment isn't way too high. It doesn't mean that a lot of people aren't suffering. It doesn't mean any of those things. But it does mean that we are growing. The economy is moving, at least uh, perhaps not as quickly as we would like, but it is moving in the right direction. Um, and we want to make sure that uh, that, uh, that progress continues. Thank you. Um, now let's go Thank to uh, San Francisco again. Hello. Uh, my name is Melinda Hatfield. I teach AP Economics at Pleasant Grove High School in Elk Grove, California. And my question is, what is the most important lesson today's high school students can take away from the recent financial crisis? Most important lesson from the financial crisis? Is yes. That, I, think, um, I think we need to address this for students at, uh, if, if I may, the macro level and the micro level. At the macro level and the point of view of history and economics, what, what this crisis shows us is uh, how damaging uh, financial instability can be for the economy as a whole. I mean, people, you know, your students may think of Wall Street as being pretty far away and pretty irrelevant to their lives, but, but we found out that if our financial system uh, is unstable or breaks down or, or is severely damaged, that it's kind of like the nervous system in the body uh, not operating properly, and you can get very, very bad effects on, on the economy, as we've seen. Um, so from uh, a historical point of view or an economic point of view, at the role of the financial system, the importance of financial stability, I think, are very, very, very important to understand, and that helps us think about the 1930s and other important episodes as well. There's also, though, sort of a micro level um, which is more of a personal or family level set of lessons that can be learned from the crisis. And I think one of the things that, that we all talked about but maybe didn't pay enough attention to is, is, is financial literacy and financial education. Um, a lot of people who are in trouble today uh, made bad decisions. They, they borrowed too much or they, uh, they purchased a home they couldn't afford. Um, they, uh, they borrow too much on their credit cards. Uh, your efforts as teachers to um, help students understand the importance of financial responsibility, to help them understand what are the uh, uh, basics, the basics of saving and budgeting, those are really critical. And students need to understand that for themselves as individuals and for the country, uh, good, sound, uh, practices, good sound behavior in, uh, in their own financial dealings is really important. And I guess I would say on the personal side also, we're learning a lot of lessons about the labor market here. Um, 
young people, uh, as, as often is the case, um, with the least experience, least experience in the labor market, are among the worst hit by the high level of unemployment, um, particularly minority uh, young people. Um, what does that tell us? Well, among other things, it tells us we need to have kids who are well-trained, well-educated, uh, who understand, uh, who, you know, who have a wide variety of, of, of basic uh, uh, skills in terms of thinking, writing, uh, math, et cetera, so that they can ad adapt and change and, 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 and deal with what could be a very unstable situation. It's always possible, uh, you know, again, we hope our economy will recover, but, but the world is changing quickly, and the more that uh, kids are prepared, the better they'll be able to uh, take advantage of technological change and changes in our economy rather than being left behind. Thank you. Now let's move to uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia, can you ask your question, please? Uh, hello, Chairman Bernanke. My name is Holly Drew, and I teach uh, financial literacy at Camden County Technical Schools in New Jersey. Uh, my question for you is, would you like to see personal finance and economic force become part of the graduation requirements for high school? And in your view, what is an important issue affecting consumers that could be mitigated with financial education? Well, first of all, one New Jersey into another. I, I, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> um, well, this relates back to the question I was just uh, just talking about. We um, we don't know as much as we would like about how to teach financial literacy. Um, we've had a number of programs here at the Federal Reserve where we have uh, monitored uh, different attempts, different approaches to teaching kids about financial literacy, and some work better than others, but we haven't really found uh, a magic bullet. And what I think uh, is needed is two things. Uh, one is we really need to do a better job of integrating uh, financial education, financial literacy into our broader curriculum. So for example, when you're teaching math, instead of just teaching um, abstract calculation, why not put it in terms of uh, working out uh, an interest payment or, or, a, uh, uh, or a budget? Um, or we can integrate it into, uh, into history or civics or economics. So there are lots of ways to do that, and I think, I think, um, uh, you know, I think that would be a more effective a way to do it. Um, another way to, I, to make this uh, uh, more effective is, is to tie it directly to, to kids' own experience in their own lives. Um, we know that people are much more prone to understand and want to learn about, say, mortgage financing when they're actually in the process of buying a house. So if kids are involved, for example, in opening a saving account or, or doing other things, saving for college, uh, that's, then those things mean a lot more to them and the, uh, the training is helpful. Um, but again, to go back to what I was saying before, this is, is so important for people at the, at the individual level and for the economy and for the financial system as a whole. When, when I was in school, and I know when you were in school, we had courses called home economics. And it didn't really have much to do with economics. It, <laughs> it had to do with uh, you know, uh, cooking and other very valuable skills. Well, um, home economics of the kind that is about uh, knowing how to budget and how to save and those kinds of things, that's, that's very important too. And I think we need to put that into the curriculum so that uh, kids will have the life skills uh, even even going into college, because we see a lot of a lot of kids get into trouble even in the college years with excessive credit card debt and and not being able to pay tuition and so on. So, um, to go back to your to your question, uh, we one of the main lessons of the crisis is that uh, we as citizens need to be responsible for our own financial uh, dealings. Uh, we can't we can't put everything on the government. We can't put everything on Wall Street. Part of it is our responsibility. And you teachers, you educators who are working with the kids, um, I hope that you'll make that part of your curriculum because it is one of the most important things that, uh, that kids can learn. Thank you. Now let's go to the uh, St. Louis district. St. Louis, please ask your question. Uh, my name is George Bowling. I teach uh, economics at St. Charles Community College. Uh, 
in St. Charles, Missouri. Mr. Chairman, my question is, according to what I've been reading, reading late recently, there's a conflict related to what banks should be doing in the economic downturn. Some people say the banks should be raising capital in order to make them stronger. Others say the banks should be spurring the economy by taking on more risk and lending more to small businesses and households. What should be the goal? So the question is about, is there a conflict between banks um, building up their capital, uh, becoming more stable on the one hand, versus helping the economy by making loans to small businesses and consumers and so on on the other hand? It's our, it's our view at the Federal Reserve that there really is not a conflict between those two objectives. And the reason is that what banks do uh, for a living, so to speak, what banks do is make loans to good borrowers. That's how they make their money. Um, so by maintaining relationships with their borrowers, by making loans to good borrowers, um, that's how they build their profits. That's how they build their capital. So uh, we think it's good business. We think uh, for banks to lend. Uh, we think it's good for the economy for banks to lend. And so from our perspective, the, you know, as, as you know, the Federal Reserve is not only uh, the monetary policy uh, agency, we also have a very substantial role in regulating the banking system. So what we tell our bank examiners who go in and look at the books of the banks is we say, take a balanced approach. And that what I mean by that is that you don't want to tell banks, no, no, you can't take any risks, don't make any loans, just curl up sort of into a little ball and just ignore the rest of the world. We don't want that. Nor do we want them to make uh, risky loans. We don't want to make loans that are not going to be paid back. That's, that's certainly not what we want either. What we want is an appropriate balance. We want banks to make good loans to good borrowers. And that includes, of course, lots of small businesses um, who, uh, who have been through a lot through this recession. And they're still there. And we need them to, to grow. We need them to hire as part of our recovery. Um, so again, there's not really a conflict in our policies uh, and our, what we tell our examiners and what we tell the banks is we just got to get the right balance. You know, we don't want to be excessively risky. We don't want to lose money. We don't want to lend to people who can't pay back, but we do want to make good loans to people who can pay back. And that means a lot of small businesses, a lot of households who have shown that they're responsible and that they're, um, they're able to, to repay what they borrow. And again, that's not just important for those individuals but it's also important to get our economy going because certainly one of the reasons that uh, growth has been sluggish, going back to, to the question, the earlier question, is that small businesses in particular not being able to get as much credit as they would like uh, are not being the uh, engine for job creation that they typically are in a recovery, and that, that is one of the things that's holding us back. Thank you. And now let's go to our Omaha branch. Omaha, are you there? My name is Shauna Cober, and I teach business at Arlington High School in Arlington, Nebraska. Chairman Bernanke, consumers need to spend money in order to stimulate the economy. However, the overextension of credit contributed to the current financial situation we are in. How do you propose educating consumers on maintaining a balance, saving and spending? And will this balance slow the recovery of our economy? Well, that's a great question. So. This is often uh, raised, which is that, uh, you know, in some sense, the, the, uh, the boom and the crisis came about because people spend too much and consume too much and borrow too much. And now to get out of it, we want people, you know, to consume more and to borrow more and to spend more. Now, what, what kind of sense does that make? Um, well, it, it, it does, but it takes an economist to understand it. So give me, give me a moment to uh, try to clarify. So first of all, at a, uh, um, at a micro level, at the, at the level of the individual family or household or individual, um, we want people to be responsible. As I've said this several times already, um, we want them to make uh, good choices. We want them to save enough. We want to make sure they don't take on excessive debts. And that often means that they have to be frugal in their spending. And that's simply the, the bottom line. So we're not encouraging people to be, to be irresponsible. We think everyone should be um, uh, live within their means and to manage their finances as well as they can. So that's that's a given. Let's just take that as given. Now that being said, um, for the economy as a whole, there has to be some source of demand 
that will put our factories and, and, and firms back to work. There's got to be some demand for the output production of, of our economy, and that we need that for recovery. And so there's like a little bit of a conflict, a contradiction between those two things. There's a couple of ways to resolve that contradiction. One is to understand that there are uh, components of demand for goods and services in our economy which are different, which are not just consumer spending. And that includes, for example, capital formation. If uh, firms are uh, adding to their, um, their uh, high-tech uh, information technology, for example, um, or if the government is spending on, uh, on bridges, uh, there are lots of different sources of demand besides consumers. Uh, a very important source of demand, of course, is exports when selling uh, goods and services to, to folks outside the country. So there are sources of demand besides consumers, and we want to, um, uh, we want to as much as we can, rely on those uh, to help our, our economy recover. But the other thing I would say to reconcile that micro and that macro contradiction is that people can spend responsibly if they have the income, and that in turn means that what we'd like to see is a labor market recovering. The labor market has been uh, growing, it's been recovering, but too slowly. Uh, unemployment rate is still too high. So to the extent that economic policies or the decisions being made by employers across the country will help our labor market grow uh, and jobs uh, be created, that's going to increase incomes. That will allow people to spend more, create more demand for products, create more growth in our economy, but without being irresponsible on the part of the individuals because they'll have more income coming from, from jobs. So they're, they're really two keys to growth that are consistent with um, responsible spending. One is to find other sources of demand, like investment spending, like, like exports. And the second is to give people the income they need to spend responsibly. And that means, basically, that means jobs. Thank you. And uh, now let's go to the Dallas Fed. Mr. Chairman, my name is Barry Johnston. I teach at the Colony High School in the Colony, Texas. And first, an unpaid plug, but the other question about having state laws or federal laws with regard to teaching personal finance, the state of Texas does have such a law, and I can tell you that the Building Wealth Program that the Fed provides has been a big help to all of us. <coughs> now, my question is, what do you believe would or could have happened if the Fed in collaboration with the government had not taken the very aggressive steps it took during the financial crisis? Well, this is a very, very important question. I, th I thank you for asking that. And this is one of the very, very difficult areas. Um, to, to put it quite, quite bluntly, a lot of your students, a lot of people in the country say, well, they bailed out Wall Street. What's that got to do with me? I mean, that's way over there. It has nothing to do with me. Um, we, we got involved in the government uh, in trying to prevent the collapse of some critical financial firms, not because we cared about the managers or shareholders of those firms. I've, I've been a professor all my life. I never worked in Wall Street. I got no particular connection to Wall Street or to banks. Um, the reason we got involved in doing that, and it was a very distasteful thing to do, and we didn't really have the right tools to do it, but the reason we did it was because we knew from history that the financial system is so critical to the functioning of our economy that the collapse of the financial system would have been catastrophic. That's what happened in the 1930s. That's what's happened in many, many other episodes. Uh, for example, in the case of Japan, Japan had a major financial crisis in the 1980s, which was a combination of a stock market crash and a land market crash, which caused their banks to suffer severely. and that. Uh, severely hampered their growth for more than a decade. So we know that a financial crisis uh, can be very, very damaging to the real economy. Um, in September and October of 2008, we came extraordinarily close to a complete collapse of the global financial system, not just the United States, but of the whole global financial system. Um, we had a meeting uh, in, here in Washington in October of uh, the G20, the 20, largest, uh, 20 of the largest countries in the world, and we talked about what we were going to do. 
And we developed coordinated plans whereby in each country around the world, we took strong steps to try to prevent the financial system from melting down, essentially. Um, now, we didn't succeed entirely, obviously. We had uh, at least one major firm collapsed. We had other firms that were required uh, government bailouts. Um, those things were, as I said, were very distasteful to us. Uh, but uh, even though we succeeded in avoiding uh, a much worse collapse, we still had a tremendously sharp global recession. And I would say that as bad as the recession was in the United States in 2008 and 2009, we were kind of in the middle of the pack. A lot of countries around the world had even worse downturns than we did. And that, all of this happened uh, following a, a basically successful attempt to stabilize the global financial system. Uh, I, I can only say that if, if the global financial system had really melted down and many firms had failed, if the ability to make loans had essentially dried up, if people had lost most of their investments, their savings accounts, their retirement accounts, um, we would not be today at least on a recovery path. We would still be in a much deeper hole, uh, something much closer to the Great Depression in the 1930s. So I do hope that uh, while clearly your students will understand that uh, not everything that the government did during the, the uh, recession and the crisis was, was right, uh, that stepping in to prevent the collapse of the global financial system was something that was necessary and it affected every single uh, American in a very important way. I guess the final thing I would say, and this is, a, is, is uh, I hope will, will help uh, people understand, while there was a lot of money made available to address the problems of the financial system, at this point it looks like we're going to get it all back pretty much all of it, um, from the financial rescues. I mean, most of these banks and have paid us back with interest. Um, again, not a great situation, not something we would ever want to do again, but um, we are getting our money back on top of everything else. So I would have to say that uh, this was a successful policy, um, not a popular one, but a successful one. Um, and again, as an economic historian, somebody who has uh, spent much of their career uh, looking at economic history, both in the United States and in other countries, I, I firmly believe that we really had to stop that collapse of the financial system or else the consequences for everybody here, for all your students, would have been much more severe than what we fact did see. Thank you. Now let's go to uh, Chicago. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Phil DePaul. I teach English at St. Joseph's High School in South Bend, Indiana. Uh, I'd like to personally thank you for your continued diligence and perspicacity during these tough economic times. My question, can you discuss what you see going forward as the strengths and potential shortcomings of the Dodd-Frank legislation and what types of safeguards have been put in place to prevent a future credit crisis? Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's a very good question. Um, so the Dodd-Frank legislation, I just spent the morning uh, actually in testimony at the Senate Banking Committee talking about implementation of the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, this was the uh, omnibus financial reform that was passed again in July of, of this year, and it's very, very comprehensive. It is certainly by far the most comprehensive financial regulatory reform since the 1930s. And it makes a lot of fundamental changes in our uh, financial system. Um, to name just a, just a few of them, uh, it creates a Financial Stability Oversight Council, which the first meeting is tomorrow, by the way, uh, which brings together the heads of all the regulatory agencies and says, let's all work together to see if we can identify any risks that might be uh, arising in our financial system. So one of the problems that happened uh, before the, the recent crisis was that um, everybody had their own little responsibilities, but there wasn't really anybody in charge of looking at the system as a whole. And what, the, uh, what this uh, legislation does is greatly strengthen the provisions to uh, require regulators not just to look at their individual fiefdom, but to look at the whole financial system and try to identify risks that that might be arising as the economy changes and the financial system changes. So that by itself is a major change. Um, in addition, the uh, Dodd-Frank Act closes a lot of gaps 
that existed. Uh, we were just talking about bailouts. Uh, AIG, which took important steps uh, today to begin to pay back the government, was essentially not regulated by anybody. Uh, nobody really was paying attention to what was going on there. Um, the investment banks, like Lehman Brothers, had very limited regulation. Their only regulatory scheme was a voluntary scheme. There was not any legal requirement for them to be regulated. Um, there were many gaps in the regulation of uh, exotic financial instruments like derivatives. Um, so there were many gaps, and many of those gaps came back and were very serious uh, contributions to the crisis. And so the um, Dodd-Frank Act closes a lot of those gaps and creates new oversight responsibilities for the Fed and for the other, other agencies. One, uh, let me mention two other things it does. One, one is it's going to create a consumer protection agency. And we've been talking today a lot about financial literacy, about people who uh, got into trouble on their mortgages or their credit cards. Some of that is the fault of the borrower. But some of it, of course, is bad disclosures or bad practices on the parts of the, of the financial institutions. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been working hard on consumer protection under my chairmanship. And uh, this new bureau, which will be within the Fed, um, uh, but independent, will uh, also be responsible for trying to provide those protections. The last uh, element I wanted to mention, which is new and important, is that uh, there are provisions now in the law that will make uh, bailouts both unnecessary and illegal. That is, should we ever come to a situation where um, a big financial firm is about to collapse and that its collapse uh, impose, uh, poses dangers to the US economy, we now have a set of rules that would allow the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to come in and seize that institution and wind it down in a safe way that will not cost the taxpayers any money and that will not, at the same time, will not create chaos in the financial system. And if we had had that three years ago or two years ago, we could have avoided a lot of what happened. And so all those things are very important, uh, important uh, contributions and uh, uh, will help uh, address financial risk, financial crises going forward. Now, this is not uh, a panacea. It's not uh, complete. There's, uh, there's a lot to be done. As our hearing we talked about this morning, um, passing the law is only the first step. The regulators have to implement these laws, which means we have to devise a whole set of rules and regulations that will make specific and concrete for the financial firms and other uh, regulated entities um, what those laws mean specifically. We have to enforce those laws. That means we have to strengthen our supervisory arm and, and make sure we have all the resources and talents we need to, to enforce those rules. So that's a lot to be done. And there's also, there's still things that, that uh, even Congress has to address. For example, uh, one of the major problems that arose was the uh, collapse of Fannie and Freddie, which were the two large housing uh, agencies uh, which had implicit government guarantees, but turned out to be, um, uh, had to be taken over by the government because of their losses in subprime and mortgages and other, and other lending. So that the Fannie and Freddie uh, reform is something that uh, it needs to be done. It's not part of the bill uh, that was passed in July. And so that's, that's an example of something that needs to be done going forward. I guess one last thing. Um, one of the things that made this crisis so difficult is that it was absolutely a global crisis. It was all over the world, uh, particularly in other industrial countries in Europe. Um, and that required a great deal of coordination. And speaking for myself, I worked very closely with uh, central bank governors around the world. We coordinated on lots of different measures that we took. Um, and that's going to be necessary also as we all go ahead and impose uh, new rules in the financial marketplace. We don't want to have one set of rules in the US and another set of rules in France and a third set of rules in Japan because financial companies will just take advantage of whichever rules are the weakest. Um, so what we need to do is make sure that we're as um, uh, coordinated as possible. And in fact, we are very much involved in international meetings. I just came back a few weeks ago from Basel, Switzerland, which is where uh, many of the largest countries of the world get together and talk about coordinating and making consistent our bank regulatory standards. Um, so the international part of this is very, very big. It's going to take a while. 
for us to not only get a good system in the U.S., but to make sure that it is consistent and coherent with um, the financial regulatory systems of other countries. So there are a lot of challenges ahead. We're not home free by any means, but I do think that this legislation, which, as I said, is by far the most sweeping since the 1930s, will give us a fighting chance to set up a system that will prevent what happened in 2008 and 2009 from, from happening again. Thank you. And now let's go to Cleveland. Uh, I'm Phil Peters. I teach economics at Gehanna Lincoln High School outside Columbus. I'm here in Cleveland with a hundred other of uh, my fellow teachers. And in our classes, we encourage our students to follow the current economic events. Uh, and our students read divergent and politicized opinions and news stories. Uh, Chairman Bernanke, does the Federal Open Market Committee hold divergent views? And what would you recommend to students on how to reconcile the differences leading to their own informed opinions? Thank you. That's a good question. So, so first of all, as I'm sure you know, but just to, to provide some context, the Federal Open Market Committee is the group of people who sit around this very table here in the boardroom uh, eight times a year to decide what we should do about monetary policy. And it consists of seven governors here in Washington, plus uh, the 12 Reserve Bank presidents from around the country, um, uh, five of whom get to vote at any given uh, at any given meeting. So that's, as I said, that's called the Federal Market Committee. It was established in the 1930s, and it's a committee that, again, makes monetary policy. Now, there is plenty of disagreement on the Federal Open Market Committee. People have different views. Uh, that's always the case. It may even be more the case today because we have such a complex situation. We've had um, uh, an economy, again, which is uh, not recovered from a deep recession. Um, we have had a lot of unusual um, and aggressive actions on the policy front, uh, some of which people have different views about. Um, so there certainly is uh, different views, there's disagreement. My attitude about that is that if two people agree on everything all the time, then one of them is redundant. Uh, <laughs> so it's good to have different views. That's why you want to have a committee. Um, one of my ex-colleagues at Princeton uh, wrote some very nice papers showing that uh, committees uh, for certain kinds of complex decisions can actually do a better job than a single than a single person, and we can all talk to each other and try and make sure we're all comfortable with what our strategy is going to be. So there is, there is uh, disagreement, uh, but ultimately the uh, committee finds a consensus and we, we, we work together to figure out what the right thing is for the country. And again, we try to do that in a way that's independent of any political considerations. Now, for your students broadly, um, let me just uh, be, be frank here. I think that one thing that's unfortunate is that people are becoming more and more uh, listening only to the side of the argument that they already believe in, right? So there's not enough, uh, you know, if you're conservative, you listen only to conservative media. If you're liberal, you listen only to liberal media. Um, I think it's really important, and, and you, I'm sure you all agree that, that we hear both sides of the story, that we, have a, uh, we listen to all different points of view, that we use critical thinking to try to figure out what we believe and what, what's right. We investigate, we do research, we, uh, we get the facts. Um, I mean, that's the way forward. The, you know, is, uh, just uh, taking extreme positions and shouting at each other is not going to get us anywhere. What we need to do is have students, and you as teachers are one of their primary sources for this, who are open-minded and critical and willing to think about a variety of perspectives. So uh, disagreement's a good thing. Uh, it creates uh, new ideas. It gives, makes, forces people to look at all the sides of a question. Uh, but uh, your students should, um, they should not be uh, overly influenced by a single media or other source. They should learn to think for themselves. And that's one of the most challenging things. And uh, while I know it's really important to get good test scores and all that kind of thing, thinking for yourself, that's, that's something that people will have for your whole life if you can help your kids get there. Thank you. Now let's go to New York. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Bernanke. My name is John Oden, and I teach in Rowley High School in Rowley, New Jersey. I teach AP U.S. government, comparative politics, and contemporary American issues. My question is, what role do you believe education will play in the future of our economy 
and how can we better prepare our students for financial success? The question is, what's the role of education in the future of our economy? And I would just say it's probably the most important uh, element of both our national future success and individual success. Just think about how the world is changing. First of all, technology is changing radically. Um, one of the uh, key explanations uh, that economists give for the increasing inequality of income in the United States and in the world has to do with technology. That people who are capable to use, of using uh, sophisticated technologies uh, earn high incomes, earn high salaries, uh, are productive. People who do not have that education, those skills, do not do nearly so well, and that's part of the reason why, um, uh, why income inequality has increased in America. Uh, what other trends are there? New industries, uh, you know, new forms of energy, new forms of climate-related uh, uh, in industries. Again, technology, creativity, uh, uh, scientific and other engineering training, all those things are going to be critical for economic success and for personal success. Um, and what's the third trend? Globalization. You know, uh, we all compete globally now. Uh, companies will move to the country where they find the best trained workers, where they, where they have the, uh, the most advantageous uh, tax laws, et cetera. Um, so if we want America to remain the place where uh, the uh, best jobs are, we have to make the best workers. That's the only way to do it. And that requires, in turn, um, uh, skills and training. Now, as I said before, I'll, I'll repeat a couple of themes from before. One is that although there are some weaknesses in the American educational system, we have some important strengths. One is our very strong university system, but another is, as I already mentioned, is that we have such a diversity of ways for people to get skills and training. Uh, in, in the current economy, there are people, of course, who've been out of work now for a period of time. Maybe the job they had is never going to come back. Uh, there are ways uh, in America to get retrained, to get new skills. Um, we talked to community college folks before. Uh, they have lots of programs for people um, uh, who are not uh, 18 years old, who are older than that. Um, and so that diversity of ways of getting training and skills is really important. It's really a strength of our economy and our country. Um, and the other is, uh, again, another theme that has been throughout this, this hour. Um, if you want to be successful, uh, having the skills uh, to get a good job or to, to launch a business uh, are important, but you also need to manage your money well. And that's where the financial literacy and the financial education comes in. And I do think, I, I, again, I do, uh, I'm very interested to hear the gentleman from Texas saying that that was a... Uh, the state requirement. I think that's actually becoming the case in, in more places around the country. But I do hope that uh, if, if, if it's not in your class, that you will push your school, push your district to make sure the kids have at least the basics of financial literacy before they graduate. Thank you. And now we have one last question, and we'll go to Minneapolis for that. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Donna Teets. I am the business education teacher at the Clear Lake High School in Clear Lake, Wisconsin. And recently, I had a banker as a guest speaker in my classroom. He stated that there are two areas that he would not lend to, and they are manufacturing and agribusiness, because those industries are leaving the US. Do you agree? So the question is about, the, about two industries, agribusiness and manufacturing. Um, now, agriculture always has ups and downs, and parts of the country may be doing well, and other parts may be doing poorly. But generally speaking, agriculture is one of the most productive sectors uh, of the United States economy. You know, as you well know, there was a time when half the population was involved in growing food. Now it's 2 or 3%, and they not only feed the whole country, but they have enough left over to be major exporters to uh, people around the world. So. Um, Again, the economics of agriculture goes up and down, and there's a lot of government programs, and it's complicated. But, but basically, that, this is an area where the United States has been very, very competitive for a long time. Uh, the other question was about manufacturing. Um, there, I think, the um, 
popular perception may be a little bit too pessimistic. The United States remains uh, the world's <coughs> strongest manufacturing country. Um, manufacturing remains a very important part of our economy. The productivity in manufacturing has been growing at a very rapid rate, faster than the rest of the economy. Um, the United States leads the world in many, many sophisticated, high-tech types of manufacturing. So it remains a very strong sector uh, in the United States and a very important source of exports uh, to other countries. Um, another observation to make is that uh, in this recovery that we, we're, we're watching unfold, uh, manufacturing has been a big part of that. The many, while many sectors, service sectors and the like, have been growing very slowly, manufacturing has expanded quite quickly, and in part because it's able to access international markets in a way that uh, many service industries are not. So, so the story of manufacturing is, uh, uh, is better than, than I think is often portrayed. Now that being said, there is one dimension which uh, is important, which is that because manufacturing has been so productive, and that is they become more and more efficient at producing using robots and other kinds of uh, sophisticated machinery, the number of workers with manufacturing jobs has gone down even as the output of the manufacturing sector has gone up. So there are far, are far fewer manufacturing jobs than there used to be, and there are particularly fewer sort of low-skilled manufacturing jobs than there used to be. So uh, to the extent that uh, there used to be a lot of people who were on um, production lines uh, making automobiles, for example, those kinds of jobs clearly are uh, reduced considerably. And from that perspective, manufacturing isn't um, uh, as big a part of our economy. But I would say, and going back to our discussion of education, um, you talk to manufacturers and they say, well, um, it's true we had to lay off some low-skilled workers, but we're still trying to find machinists, welders, people with high skills can't find them. Uh, so for people with high skills, um, there are plenty of jobs in manufacturing and in the economy in general. So um, that is just one more example of why education is, is so critical. So manufacturing in the United States is, is a growing industry. It's an important part of our economy. It's not as big an employer as it used to be, but uh, it, it does play a very important part of, uh, important role in our recovery and in our international trade. Thank you. Is that and it? That's it. And well, the three thirty on the dot. That's really impressive. Oh. Uh, we covered everybody. Again, I just want to just say, uh, as, as Rose mentioned, my wife's a teacher. She's been a teacher for a long time. She she recently started her own school, and uh, there's nothing more important than what you do because you affect the lives, the individual lives, and the careers, the aspirations, and the abilities of our kids. And that's just really. Uh, critical. And uh, I thank you for taking the time to come talk to me and to visit the Fed. And I just want to wish you the best in what you do and, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you.